seven minutes from where we are today, you'll reach a hospital. It's an old hospital for the poor called the Finsbury Dispensary. And in the early 19th century, hundreds of women seemed to have one thing in common. Their faces were green. This condition was called chlorosis. Now, if you had chlorosis, your medical records would look something like this. The doctor would say, this woman's face is decidedly green, she's melancholic, she's tired, and her periods are absolutely chaotic. Good news though, doctors had a cure for you. You were told to stop drinking coffee and to start dressing appropriately. <laughs> I'm looking at you in the front row. Uh, one male expert also suggested that all women with the condition should copulate as soon as possible. <laughs> I'm still looking at you in the front row. Now, this was an international diagnosis, but it had disappeared by around 1900 because we had different explanations for these same symptoms. Some of these women probably had endometriosis or anemia or thyroid problems. The other thing that happened, and this is slightly embarrassing given that I was a doctor, this condition was around for 400 years and it took all of that time before doctors realized that these women had not been green after all, it had just been the imagination of the doctors. I apologize for all doctors in this regard. Diagnosis is just a label. You go to the doctor and you've got a symptom, maybe you've got a cough or a pain, and the doctor runs some tests and they give you a diagnosis. So your cough becomes asthma or your pain becomes arthritis. And that diagnosis is really useful to you because it means you can explain your symptoms now. You can make sense of them. This is why I've had a cough. It also means you can get the right medications like inhalers and of course you can get to the right specialists. But you can see very quickly how diagnosis is molded by factors other than science. So chlorosis was very much about the morals of the time. It was a judgment about how you behaved or how you misbehaved. I was a doctor for 15 years, a neurologist, and I believed in diagnosis. Science was on my side. But then I became an investigative journalist and I started to wonder, is diagnosis still informed by what we look like and how we behave? Does bias still influence our diagnosis? And in order to answer these questions, I went and I gathered stories. And I'd like to tell you three of those stories today, beginning with the story of Jeremy. Jeremy was a teenager when he received his diagnosis. But he's now in his late 60s. He lives in the Lake District and he works outdoors. He works with his dog, Timmy, a rescue dog alongside him. And he builds, Jeremy this is, builds stone walls. He still has the rugby build of his youth. When Jeremy was 14, he received a diagnosis. When he was 14, he fell in love with a boy called Stephen. And when the priests at school found out, one of them walked him to the local psychiatric hospital. Jeremy received his diagnosis and it was called homosexuality. This was an official psychiatric diagnosis that day in June 1972, and it was recognized by the World Health Organization until 1990. Now, we know that a diagnosis leads you to treatment, and in Jeremy's case, that was electric shock treatment. He was brought by a man into a room, and his wrists were tied to the sides of a chair. He was a teenager. And a man in a white coat hooked Jeremy up to a machine and then delivered electric shocks for an hour and 15 minutes, agonizing. Jeremy then had to return for months all the way through his A-levels, and he was told not to tell his parents, although it turned out they had known all along. Homosexuality was an official diagnosis recognized by major medical organizations. There were peer-reviewed journal articles about it. There were clinical trials searching for so-called cures. And the fact that this was a diagnosis for me really comes down to bias. You know, bearing in mind that some of these trials weren't just covered, but they were celebrated in newspapers like The Guardian and The Times and The Scotsman. So why did this bias come around and how did it inform this diagnosis? Well, society had already judged Jeremy and others. They were judged for how they lived and who they loved. 
and as a result, their so-called behaviors were labeled, they were medicalized. Hundreds of people across the UK received this sort of treatment, and tragically, some took their own lives. Jeremy tried to take his many times, and to this day, he can't wear a watch around his wrist because it reminds him of the straps that were used to tie him down. He tells me that time and therapy have helped him to deal with some of the trauma, what he endured, what was done to him, and he quite likes his life now, he tells me. It took him a long time to get here, but he did. Just as bias influences whether a diagnosis exists in the first place, it also influences what diagnosis we get. I want to bring us back to the present day, and I want you to imagine you're at the doctor's, you're outside the room waiting to go in, and you're with your child or your nephew or your niece, and they've been having some behavioral issues, they've been acting out, they're impulsive. Now, you're doing the right thing, you're trying to get them support. So in you go, and what happens there is really going to dictate the next few weeks and months and years for you. If your child is white or Asian, they are more likely, with some of these symptoms, to get a diagnosis of ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But if your child is black or Latino, they're far more likely to get a diagnosis called Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Now, here's why that makes a difference. And again, I want you to think about the next few weeks and months and years. Kids with ADHD ideally are sent towards support and behavioral therapy and maybe accommodations made for them at school. And it's a long journey, I appreciate that. But think about the seven-year-old, let's say, with oppositional defiant disorder. Instead, you're going to be sent to parent management training. And that's because your parenting is officially seen as defective. That could be you next weekend, you're going to parent management training or aunt training or uncle training. And think about the impact that has on a seven-year-old child. They go into school on Monday, and in the file, the teacher's going to see a diagnosis, oppositional defined disorder. And you can understand how a teacher is going to lower their expectations in this situation and maybe tighten up their discipline. And these children are more likely to fall out of the mainstream medical system and education systems and into the criminal justice system. For me, this comes back to this idea of bias, because these diagnoses are decided at medical conferences, at scientific conferences, and they get refined there every year, and then that diagnosis travels through hospitals and clinics, and it ends up in your home. And if you can imagine at any point during that journey, you can get systemic biases jumping on at any station. This is the way that race is mapped onto perceived hostility. These children are seen as disobedient and they are labeled as dangerous. There are ways to revolutionize these behavioral diagnoses, and I want to talk about that. But first of all, I want to make a case for change by telling you one final story. And this is the story of Mikey Powell, His family know that I'm telling you this today. I heard about Mikey from his family when they told me that he had died at a Birmingham police station after being restrained. And he received a diagnosis after his death. That diagnosis was called excited delirium, and I had never heard about it in my 15 years as a doctor. Let me tell you about Mikey. He was 38 years old. He was a fun-loving, dedicated dad, his family told me. He spent half the week with his partner and kids, and then the other half with his mother, looking after her. He liked to put on reggae parties at people's homes. He had mental health issues, but he was fine on medications from his GP. One September day, he had an episode. He put his fist through a window, and his mother called the police. She called the police because they had helped before. They'd been fantastic. Mikey had had another episode in the past, and the officers had come, and they'd talked him down off the roof. They all had a cup of tea together, and off they went. This time is different, and I know what I'm going to tell you is difficult to hear. On this occasion, they arrived, and they told Mikey to get down on the ground. Mikey refused. 
he hit their car with a belt. The officers then ran their car at him and ran him down. They hit him with a baton. They handcuffed him. They sprayed him with CS gas. And at one point, there were eight officers on Mikey Powell on the ground for 15 minutes or more. He was then placed in a van wedged between the seats, and he was brought to a custody cell. And it was there that officers realized that Mikey had stopped breathing. There was an investigation and officers were up on various charges, including assault. And at this point, Mikey's family told me that this diagnosis was forwarded, this diagnosis of excited delirium. And the inference was that Mikey had died because of some innate biological malfunction within his body, some mechanism had gone wrong, some disease. It wasn't anything to do with being restrained on the ground or the police van being wedged between those seats. It was Mikey, it was him, it was his body. In the end, all the officers were acquitted. There were no disciplinary charges, there were no criminal charges, and that's even though an independent inquest a decade later found that Mikey Powell, on the balance of probability, had died because of a lack of oxygen following police restraint. The cases I talk about when it comes to excited delirium, I know I'm talking about the police here, but it, it's not the officers that make the diagnosis, of course, it's doctors. And the diagnosis is made in the autopsy lab by pathologists or medical examiners. Even though this is something that is seen after restraint, sometimes these cases do go to court, for example. And when they do their examination, their autopsy, it's not like they find some biological signature of excited delirium. Instead, these medical examiners depend on a behavioral report. They need to know how the victim was acting right before they died. So who do they get this behavioral report from? They get it from law enforcement. In other words, the diagnosis of excited delirium is based on the account of the people who restrained the victim in the final moments before their death. Here's what the report looks like if you have excited delirium. The report will say this person, the victim, was breathing rapidly, they were sweating profusely, they were struggling. That's what the report says. But I was thinking about this, you know, if, if all of us got restrained outside here tonight, eight officers on us for 15 minutes, we would all be struggling and hyperventilating and sweating, and that wouldn't be some disease within us. That would just be us trying to survive. This comes back to bias, because who gets diagnosed with excited delirium after these cases of restraint? It's usually men, and it's almost always people of color, and people with mental health issues. And bias feeds into bias, because the people, if you look at custody deaths in this country, the people most likely to have been restrained are people from black and minority communities. Excited delirium, you might not have heard of it the way I hadn't in my whole career as a doctor, but it's an international diagnosis. There are around 800 cases a year in the States, but we only know about the ones that go to court, like that of George Floyd. So I started digging into cases here in the UK, and I found about two dozen. And then it seemed that the numbers were going down. And then I saw a different sort of pattern. I started finding training courses on excited delirium, so anyone can become an expert on it. And as I was trying to understand what happened, I realized that the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has just endorsed this diagnosis. It has been relabeled as ABD, acute behavioral disorder. It's got the same signs, same symptoms. They're calling it a description now rather than a diagnosis. They've written this critical guidance, this handbook for medics and paramedics, for police officers, for lawyers. So I looked at this handbook. I looked into who wrote this critical guidance. And I discovered that the co-author is the medical director of the Metropolitan Police. These stories, while I investigate them, they were overwhelming to me, and, and I'm sure they may be to you as well. And you sort of think, well, what, what can we all do? And I wanted to try and leave us here today with two very concrete things uh, that we could all do to try and think about how we can make diagnosis better. The first of those involves 
you going in to your GP or your specialist doctor. And it involves really dismantling diagnosis, rethinking it entirely. So think like this, you go in to your doctor and let's say you've got a diagnosis of asthma and you get put on inhalers. When you go for a follow-up appointment, you review the medications with your doctor and there's a, discuss a discussion around whether the inhaler should be stopped or changed, rejected entirely. So why don't we do the same thing for diagnosis? Why don't you have an annual appointment, a collaborative dialogue with your doctor, whereby you say, well, is this diagnosis helping me? Is it harming me? Should we reject it? Should we change it entirely? There's something else, though, because the issue with that first solution is that's diagnosis by the time it's here. We need to attack diagnosis when it's here, when it's at these medical conferences every year. Because the problem with those conferences and those rooms is that they don't represent the people who are diagnosed. So here's the thing, you can sign up to these medical conferences. It's one way to spend your weekend, I realize that, but you can, you can sign up to them. And you can go either as a patient with lived experience or a patient advocate, and you can make sure that room represents the people who are diagnosed. Now, I promise, for anyone who's skeptical in the audience, I promise this can happen. I remember being a junior doctor and going into a conference on ALS or motor neuron disease. It's a terminal condition. People have a life expectancy of three to five years. And I walked into that auditorium and half the people in there were people with ALS. And they weren't there in some tokenistic way. They were there in a way that profoundly changed the way we thought and we spoke about the condition. Diagnosis is valuable, but it is also fallible. And it took the stories of people like Mikey and Jeremy to help me to see that. I hope that their stories today will help you to rethink diagnosis also, so that we can all receive the care and the compassion that we deserve. Thank you for listening.